Hello, welcome to another Sonic Lab. Today we're looking at the Keith Macmillan K-Mix. Here it is. What is the K-Mix? Well, the K-Mix, as you could imagine, is a mixer. It's an 8 input, 10 output digital mixer with presets and onboard DSP. It's also a USB audio interface, 24-bit uh, 96K. It's also a uh, control surface, MIDI control surface, uh, allows you to use Keith Macmillan's uh, patented touch technology. And as you can see, we've got the little uh, LED uh, VU meters and displays underneath. So we've seen this around for a little while, it's just becoming available in the shops and it basically, the idea behind it is it's a compact solution for a lot of problems all in one box. So let's take a look. So I'd say the unit's probably about the size of an uh, old school iPad in terms of surface area. It's a plastic ABS case with a kind of plasticized or rubberized finish, you know, the sort of thing. So slightly waxy kind of feel. It makes it feel quite classy, actually. Obviously, what we've got are these uh, little 70 mil faders, which are similar to the things that you find on the Cuneo. I think perhaps they're a little bit bigger, though. And they're the, the Keith Macmillan sort of patented touch faders, and they are very sensitive. You don't really need to kind of press very hard on them. Uh, they've got LED uh, backlight, so you can see the sort of signal if you go up to the red, it's, it follows the sort of VU tradition. They look quite bright in this shot, but in, in strong light, they're not actually all that bright. I'm told there may be a firmware update coming that allows you to set the brightness of these, which would be pretty cool. Uh, as I say, there's eight of these, one for each of the input channels, and there's also a master fader. Uh, there's also these uh, rotary encoders or rotary uh, pads, which are the same that you find on the Cumio, that kind of format. They may be slightly different. And so if I go into uh, pan mode, you can see they've got a little bit of light underneath them to show you whereabouts you are. They also uh, add work for controls for the onboard gate, compressor and EQ for each channel. Uh, and that you get to those by pressing these mode buttons. Uh, perhaps a bit more on that a little bit in a second. Uh, as well as that, there's a control surface which they call the Diamond, uh, the Keith Macmillan Diamond, and that uh, works standard Mackie transport control, stop, start, record and rewind. And also this works as a shift button, so, uh, well, a bank button. So if I press shift, you can see I'm in mix mode because that's the one that's green. Uh, if I go to one, that's one set of controllers, two, three. So basically there are three sets of, or three layers of controllers that you can assign any of these faders and buttons. Uh, speaking of the buttons, um, the buttons actually are used to uh, select the channel that you're currently editing. So if I'm in, say, EQ mode, I press the EQ button here, I'm EQing one, two, three, etc., etc. Uh, in terms of they don't work as mutes uh, in mixer mode. What to mute things? What you would do is you press Shift. I'm doing this one-handed, so it's not as awkward as it looks. And then press so Shift and the bottom. So you can see that's now red. So that shows that that channel's muted. Shift and again, sorry, Shift and it's unmuted, and that recalls the level that you're at. And the same, you've also got Shift and Solo. Shift solo, so that now shows in slightly orange and the rest are green, and that would come out if you've got it assigned at the headphone output. Let's take a look at the inputs. Round the back we've got Keith Macmillan custom design mic preamps with AKM A to Ds, 24 bit, in fact they're all 24 bit, these are combi nitric connectors. They've also got a high Z mode so you can plug a guitar or instrument straight into it. Then we've got TRS inputs for the extra eight channels. Uh, these are all balanced, as uh, TRS says. In fact, each of those additional inputs can be switched to phono level, which are RIAA balanced phono or turntable inputs. So you could connect up to three turntables to this mixer if you so desired. Then finally, uh, in terms of connectivity, we've got two USB ports. Now this is quite interesting. There's a micro and a mini. I forget which way around they are, but they are different. So essentially, if you plug the audio in, it will be powered. At the moment, this is powering from my computer, and that will handle all the audio and MIDI over one cable. But because this works in standalone mode, what you could do, for instance, is power it in the control port. So you'd power it off a power supply, and then you might maybe plug a tablet in here, which would mean that it wouldn't take so much power, so that the, the KMIX would be able to feed like an, uh, an iOS device or something like that. Then we've, additionally, we've got these 
eight outputs here, which again on balanced. Uh, in mixer mode, what these do is they correspond to the auxiliary outputs, which are all stereo auxiliaries. So you've got essentially, well, six auxiliary sends. The main monitors come out of one and two. If I just come to the front here, you probably won't be able to see, but there is a mini jack connector just here, which is the headphone output, which you can use for monitoring. You can, you can also set that up to be another additional output, giving you 10 overall. So you could have that being fed from auxiliary sends or whatever. But there's also another mode, which is a base management mode, which allows you to roll off the upper frequencies. You could use this to feed a sub. So you've actually got quite a lot of flexible outputs. Uh, Phantom power, 48 volts available for inputs one and two. So in terms of the audio interface, uh, it's relatively straightforward, though there is a bit of a twist. You've got eight inputs, which show up in your DAW, and 10 outputs, which will be returned back to the mixer, which can be processed in different ways. In terms of the inputs, you can have them either pre or post. If they're post, it means that the input, the analog input would come in, be processed by the EQ compressor, and then be sent back to the computer. So effectively, you'll be recording it with those effects. In pre mode, they're just tapped off straight after the ADC with the gain, and that's it. That is configurable on a per fader basis, but only via the software editor. In terms of the returns coming back from the computer, as I say, we've got 10. Uh, one and two automatically come into the mixer and they will be summed to uh, the K-Mix output just before the master fader. But you can also configure each of these eight input channels to be pre or post USB returns so that the return could come in via the fader. You'd, you'd sacrifice those analog inputs, but then these would control and be able to process the USB return. These again are all switchable individually, if you like. Uh, I'm saying 10 outputs because the additional stereo output can be configured to come out of the headphone output, if you so wish. That's all straightforward, quite flexible, because it means you can have a pair of outputs going to the outside world via these hardware outputs or a pair of inputs coming into the mixer or multiple pairs of coming into the mixer and swap them between uh, the analog inputs. So you've got quite a lot of flexibility. The only problem is that's a global setting. Again, only accessible by the editor. It's not something that's stored in a preset for the desk, which I think is perhaps a bit of an oversight. It would make more sense, certainly to me, to be able to store that in a preset, because otherwise, if you did want to change it, say, between songs, you'd have to get the editor up and start fiddling about and do that, and that, that's never good, in my opinion. So I'm hoping that Keith McMillan might address that in a future firmware update, because this is totally firmware updatable, and I know Keith McMillan are working on firmware updates as we speak. If we come back to the outputs, the other thing that you can do with the control output, if you have one, is connect one of these Keith Macmillan, whoops, wrong way around, MIDI expanders, which basically gives you an additional set of MIDI I.O. because on MIDI ports, which is very useful, so the whole thing could be a standalone MIDI rig, uh, because obviously this unit doesn't have any MIDI uh, to the outside world other than via USB to and from the computer. Here we have all the presets and the mode buttons. So uh, you, can rec you can store up to 12 mixer configurations on these presets by pressing the preset button. But all of these buttons here, they affect the mode. So in main mode, my faders are the channel output volumes. I've got auxiliary send mode, so I can send in auxiliary sends, one, two, and three. Then I've got a compressor. If I'm pressing compressor, then the top rotary encoders become the corresponding uh, parameters. So for instance, this is uh, threshold, ratio, release and gain. If I come down and go pan, then these become the pan controls, EQ, then I've got my EQ. I will say these buttons, while I'm very close up on these, you can read them very easily, but you can imagine from a distance. So if I'm back here, it's actually quite, which is where my head is roughly, it's actually quite hard to read that apart from when they're lit up, which they show quite nicely. On this side, we've got uh, these additional buttons. Now, shift mode enables us to do things like, like I said, shift and mute, shift and solo. Bypass allows us to bypass the individual elements of each channel, so we could bypass the compressor gate, pan EQ separately. Fine control allows us to set the level, very far, the fine control level of the volume and VU turns this into VU mode, so the VU uh, will show from the inputs. So in terms of operation, it's really designed to be able to be as much hands-on or standalone as you want, because don't forget you can use this in standalone mode, and that's where there's a few little quirks and uh, 
gotchas in terms of how you might want to use it. So for instance, if I come here, uh, obviously if we're in mixer mode uh, and I decide, let's just come out of solo, and I decide I wanted to mute, you know, play mutes and uh, on various channels, I can do it this way. It seems like, to be honest, if you're in mixer mode, I don't really see the point of not using these buttons as you know, maybe assignable mutes because that would be much easier and more intuitive to mute and a return than, than doing this, for instance. So that's one little thing that's a little bit quirky. And the same goes for if I'm in aux send mode, say for instance I wanted to spin off a certain amount of delay into you know, either the reverb, the onboard reverb, there's a little onboard reverb processor, or perhaps you know, I might have an external delay plugged in. My mind, I would think, well, okay, so I'm in aux one mode, I should press that and I should just be able to mute that, that send. It doesn't work that way. Shift only works in terms of muting the master. And again, these buttons aren't doing anything. They could be useful for, you know, muting sends and unmuting sends. So let's take a listen to the mic pre, see what they sound like. So what I've got here is the SE Electronics Voodoo VR1. It's just coming in flat. I've also on the screen here got the monitor mixer. You can see that I'm recording input from analog one. This is just the flat ribbon mic. There's nothing going on here. Uh, one thing that you might be able to see here, if I maybe uh, zoom in a bit, uh, so we've got a bit more obvious lots going on there's a rumble filter which is actually very useful particularly with the ribbon mic which got very wide so i can uh, do a, a roll off this is only available via the editor you can't access the via front panel we've also got an eq here uh, i seem to have uh, rolled off a bit of bottom end and i'm dropping quite a lot of t top end sorry about that pop there i haven't got a pop filter set up so the eq is a uh, high and low shelf and uh, mid eq level uh, actually the way that this works is uh, you hit the EQ button uh, this is the low gain then pressing shift will change the frequency if I'm on the mid I've got the level of the frequency the actual frequency then shift will give me Q and then this is the get this is the the gain and then again shift will give me the high end the actual high end so if I just drop the frequency down here now, the other thing that we've got is a uh, compressor. I'll just pop this in and I'll take the threshold down a bit. Down, 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 get the makeup game going on. It's actually, uh, it's quite, you can get some quite effecty, oh, that's a bit of feedback from my headphone, you get some quite effecty uh, compression going on here. I've got access all of these parameters here again via shift buttons. So if I then, if I get this really hypey, hype, 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 you can start to hear the fan coming in and also you can hear the feedback from my headphones. So if I put the gate on, you know, you can set the gain reduction and the level, all the sort of things that you'd normally expect, attack and release. So I could get quite a nice sort of channel signal path going on through this. So let's take a look at some other parameters while we're here. Oh, we've obviously got a basic onboard reverb. One, two, two, two. It's not the best in the world, it goes up to about two seconds. But the interesting thing is it's got a very long pre-delay, almost a well actually a second so you can almost do a sort of a delay a single tap delay or oh, very unusual effects but that's quite handy we should also take a look at the surround mode it's possible to come into a quad octo 5.1 and 7.1 each has a different configuration and you can set the outputs up how you wish uh, you also got the ability for bass management which means you can set a uh, uh, upper cutoff frequency so you could then if you switch that on the headphone output becomes the sub output so you could use it with a sub system that's kind of handy I'm not sure I maybe use this for surround mixing but I suppose the thing is is because it gives you all of these possibilities you know this is what I'm talking about the Swiss army knife kind of effect it will do a lot of different things uh, let's get onto the MIDI control side of things because as we said there are three layers of control uh, bank one bank two bank three you can set up all of the controllers can be uh, CC numbers. This is the, the, the rotaries and the faders. Three values across each bank. Each bank uh, can have its own MIDI channel. So you've got a lot of parameters that you can choose there. You can also use the buttons in control mode, which will be note values, and all of these additional buttons as well can be programmed. Now, the only thing about this is that when it said that it was in Huey mode, uh, the transport control only works as Huey. It would be really nice if we could have a, a kind of dedicated bank for backy control so we could use these faders to be uh, you know like banking faders like you would in a traditional Mackie, you know, Mackie control setup. 
These are where you can set all the USB global settings. And also over here, there's this little tab, which is normally switched off, but this allows you to save and recall many more presets and just load them into various slots. So if you're working on a particular gig, you could load your settings in, you know, for that particular 12 and leave the rest on the computer. So my camps to my ears actually sound really good. There's plenty of range, there's very little noise. I didn't really detect anything. And that was a very challenging microphone to run a ribbon mic in it. So it's capable of doing that. And there was plenty of gain to spare as well. As far as the software goes, we're running this on OS X. Uh, it does run on uh, Windows. They just announced the availability of that today. I haven't got a system I can test that on, so you'll have to take our word for it that it must be available. Would it be nice to see it on iOS, really, because that's the sort of thing that you could imagine if you're not running a laptop, you still want to get to edit to some of those hidden features. It would be really cool. So it does a heck of a lot, this thing. I mean, it's like, it is kind of like a Swiss Army knife. It's very compact, small, tiny footprint, you know, will run off USB, bus powered or computer powered. You know, you could almost take this and have the need for nothing else. I mean, a couple of things, you know, like I said, I, it would be great to be able to have these channel buttons when you're in the main mode to do something like mutes make a lot of sense and a few other little foibles the other thing was uh, you know Mackie control mode would be really nice properly implemented or at least you know so we could use the faders and the master actually i did get a little uh, a little bird told me that uh, they are working that on that as a possibility but there's no release date for that as yet but it's around about 529 UK pounds and 579 US dollars. So it's not the cheapest thing in the world, but it is incredibly compact and really, really useful in terms of doing things. I mean, you could almost just take this on a laptop and almost be ready for any situation in terms of recording, maybe even live mixing, playback. It's the sort of thing that if you had lying around, you know, it could do almost anything. Or if you want a mobile rig, I think it's got a lot to offer. In fact, I know a couple of people who swear by it because it just does everything that they need. You know, they don't need to take any other audio interfaces. They've got mixer, they've got all of that possibility. So I think all in all, Keith McMillan again have done a really sort of innovative and interesting job. I just think perhaps there's a few things in firmware that would make this even better. So that's it. Thanks very much for watching. This has been Sonic Lab. We'll see you next time.